The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. So hello everyone, um, this is Jakob Holt from TWO and we are starting our quarterly webinar number three. Usually um, Ralph Savage, our head of communications is doing this, uh, but today you're gonna have to um, bear with me and try and, I'm trying to figure out how to work the, the technology here. Um, Ralph is in happy circumstances. He was uh, receiving a second son uh, two days ago. So he's on paternity leave which is uh, fantastic for him and a little bit challenging for me, uh, <laughs> standing in on short notice. We have uh, 22 attendees online and um, just uh, reminding you all of uh, the rules, so to speak. Uh, we are speaking, you are allowed to, you can ask questions, any questions you want in the chat uh, that you have in the, in the bottom and I will, uh, I will uh, try to see if I can answer the questions as we go along. Um, <clears throat> we are brought, we are, uh, we are recording the session uh, simply to uh, be able to show competition uh, authorities that we are not talking about uh, prices or price fixing or anything of the sort and, and keeping all of us out of trouble. All right, uh, let's begin. December 2019. Let's see, here we are. So here's the agenda for today. <clears throat> we'll give you an update on uh, new versions of the criteria coming up April 2020. So those would be criteria both for training providers and certification bodies. Then we have a new upload fee uh, reduction as of January 2020. We have an update on the development work we're doing on the new standard for control of hazardous energy. Um, and then there's the Q3 2019 report, uh, statistics for uploads, uh, announcement, uh, maybe some of you have seen it, that we're joining forces with uh, GWEC to look into what is the uh, forecast on, on workforce needs in new markets, and then the calendar at the end. And you can, as, as I said, type in questions as we go along. I'll see if I can, um, I can address those questions. All right. So, updates to the GWO criteria. So the objective here is to improve our governance uh, while still staying uh, simple uh, or with a simple setup that's manageable. Um, and the terms of reference of, the, 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 uh, of this project is to um, uh, refine some paragraphs and sections to ensure clearer guidance and clarity. Uh, that uh, definitions and guidelines and processes are all up to date and aligned globally. Uh, so it fits in with our global alignment project where also all of the standards are being reviewed by uh, uh, working groups in, we've done it in North America, we've done it in Australia, or we are about to do it in Australia, have just done it in Australia, uh, other regions as well, making sure that the, the wording and the definitions and all of that uh, not only align uh, uh, legally, but also with the uh, uh, the understanding of the English language that differs a little bit across uh, the globe. Um, we will be including in the criteria for from starting April uh, an incident reporting guideline that is already in use. So when you have incidents uh, that um, are <clears throat> uh, of of uh, uh, seriousness uh, that allow that that. We use the OSHA, U.S. OSHA guidelines for for incident reporting. So when you have an incident that uh, that is more serious than uh, than that, or as serious, so, so you need to report it according to OSHA. You also report it to us uh, when it happens during training. That is, um, and we will uh, provide a reporting guidelines so we're sure we get all of the details in. And the objective of this is, of course, uh, so that we can all learn and that we can provide some lessons learned uh, across training centers and that we can um, update our training standards if need be, uh, if we discover that we have more incidents in certain lessons or elements uh, than we, we need to, then we need to also update the, the instructions to you as training providers. Then there's something about the potential auditor profile. Uh, this is something that will help us ensure we have a paper trail 
um, in in winter, and uh, and for most of the training providers, this is uh, this will be a, uh, hopefully a, an improvement because it means that when you have ex extensions or renewals, it will happen faster. Um, and again, uh, something about uh, uh, global uh, globalization. We uh, we use uh, in many instances European specific norms, and we want to use norms that are recognized everywhere. So we're now citing not just the EN norms, but NC norms, GB norms, so forth. Right. Um, deliverables is uh, updated training provider and certification body criteria, uh, hopefully for um, for publication and for for use by April 1st. Uh, some of the things in those criteria may not be in effect until October uh, 2020 or even April 2021. Uh, when you change governance, you need to be able to uh, change your um, your documentation and your systems, management systems, uh, and we need to be able to also receive the information that will get in the additional things and handle that. So there might be a lead-in time here. And when we do, uh, when we uh, are done with this uh, project, we will conduct a webinar to update everyone on, on this, and it, likely we will also discuss it in our uh, quarterly webinars. So the working group members are here, a uh, good mix of uh, owner operators, uh, wind turbine manufacturers, training providers, and uh, certification bodies. And here's the timeline. Uh, it's a normal stage gate review, like a stage gate model uh, project. Uh, so we do have um, a number of tele telco meetings. Usually, when we have projects, we have uh, kickoff workshops in person, uh, and those are the green ones you see on the line. Uh, in November and February, there are workshops in persons. Then we have uh, working groups on telco. And we use, in this case, since the uh, this this working group is very much a uh, um, European-based working group, we will do some regional hearings uh, with uh, selected people in North America and uh, in Asia Pacific um, to make sure that we have the, that alignment across. Right. So I don't, I haven't seen any questions from, uh, from you in the chat uh, function, <clears throat> but there is a question maybe here up here. Let's see, from, is it yeah, from uh, Hugo Fraga? Is it plan to have a winter auditor database? Uh, no, we we have a, a list of auditors on the website. So any anyone who is uh, right now uh, has proven to us that they meet the criteria for auditors are on the website and available there. Uh, so you can see that the the plan you could say is yes we can it it will be a database of a sort. So we have a database of a sort. Uh, published on the website. Uh, the the new addition here is simply to give them a profile inside Winda um, to handle the paperwork in the background. Right. So let's move on. On the second thing on Winda, uh, it's a new fee structure from 2020. Um, I think I have a slide on that as well. So as most of you know, uh, the, the fee today is 10 euros. So every time you upload a record of one module, you pay a credit and a credit valued at 10 euros. So since we are a not-for-profit organization and since we have a, a reasonable success uh, in, in volumes and scale, we are now able to lower that uh, fee uh, from 10 euros. And the way we decided to do this is to um, related to the Human Development Index value. And the Human Development Index is something that's published by the United Nations every year, almost every year in the last uh, 18 years. So it's the only global index that somehow ranks countries according to their purchasing power. Um, in the Human Development Index, it's more than just purchasing power. It's uh, also life expectancy and education and, and so forth. So it's not completely uh, aligned with purchasing power, but it's close enough. 
and this will um, give new uh, new fee uh, 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 fee costs that are lower. On the average, uh, the average fee will be eight point three two euros. Um, with some countries, those as you can see on the map that are in the darker darker green, would be more than nine euros. And then the, those that are in the lighter color, so even in the red colors, will go even lower. And I think the lowest uh, we will have would be in Pakistan at five and a half or something like that, if I if I'm not mistaken. Um, so this should go out. <clears throat> it's uh, in development still, and we're still struggling a little bit with the uh, supplier to uh, to deliver the solution. Um, but uh, we have a promise to go live with it on 1st of January. Uh, I, I can warn you already now that we may have to break the promise a little bit and go live and maybe on the 6th, uh, because we do need to make sure that everything actually works. Um, but the new fee structure will be implemented uh, beginning of the new year uh, with the intention, or of my intention is to go on at January 1st, if the techni technicalities uh, uh, are not, you know, helping us, we might we might have to go in a little bit into January. But uh, when you're waiting for a good thing, it's not a problem. So here are reasons why not for profit volume scale allows for lower pricing. And the last bullet here is that um, we do have a continued growth, and we do think that the new fee structure, even if it it reduces our income, uh, all things equal, uh, being equal by 17%. Our growth is about 20%, so we will have enough uh, and sufficient income uh, on a not-for-profit basis to deliver on the promises that we make for 2020. So now we'll get into development of new standards, control of hazardous energy. And I believe, uh, Alex uh, Booker, that you are online as well to help us. Yes. Yeah, Great. I'm here, yeah. Wait, wait a minute. You know, we have a question. Um, yeah, that's a question on the, um, on the fee. So someone asked if the discount when you purchase a big amount of credit it disappears, correct? Yes, that's correct. So when you, in the past, we have had a, a policy of giving you a 4% discount if you purchase uh, more than 500 credits at a time, that will disappear. Because we, we are not interested in, um, in, in being a bank uh, or, be, or have a, <clears throat> we don't have a problem with, um, with our cash uh, flow. And there's no reason for us to, to accumulate uh, unused credits in our system. Uh, so I would rather have that that money uh, is available to you as training centers. So we will, we will remove uh, so that incentive to to purchase big amounts. Instead, the price will go down with by at least four uh, percent. Uh, at least four percent. That means in in Norway it goes down by four percent. Everywhere else it will go down by much more than four. Hope that was. A, sufficient answer to that. So over to you, uh, Alex, on control of hazardous energy training standards. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jakob. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're all very well. Um, control of hazardous energy is a is a kind of a very important topic within the wind industry. I was involved during my time working for Vestas um, with their, their lotto program and their control of hazardous energy and electrical safety when that was rolled out. So it's been kind of uh, close to my heart. So I'm actually really excited to be working on this project. Um, Jakob, could I get the next slide, please? Yes, you can. So uh, there is a big warning because some of the images that I'm going to show you next are quite graphic. Um, the reason I'm, I'm putting these in is really to highlight the importance of this training. Um, Technicians are working up in a, in a turbine and they are working with hazardous energy sources of 
various different um, kinds. So you've got electrical energy, you've got hydraulic pressure, and you've got rotating parts and other moving parts. And they're doing all of that 80 to 100 meters or higher off the ground, and they're far away from sort of help. So rather than sort of uh, dealing with the consequences of rescuing people from having an incident, we would like to equip people with the knowledge to be able to avoid the incidents. So next slide, please, Jakob. Here you go. The, thank you. The first uh, images actually show an arc flash. And an arc flash is basically, or results from a short circuit in an electrical system. Um, the thing with an arc flash is we are dealing with a lot of energy. So they can actually reach temperatures of around 8,000 degrees Celsius. And that is uh, very high, causing um, extreme burns to technicians and people that are exposed to them. Um, the other risk with arc flashes is that they actually vaporize copper and vaporized copper is actually conductive so that can actually lead off into other parts of the electrical system and actually initiate a bigger arc flash or a fire so that is one of the areas that uh, we will definitely look into next slide please and uh, hydraulics um, and the thing with hydraulics is we're dealing with very very high pressures and one of the risks associated with that is actually very small leaks in the system like pinholes, um, tiny little leaks. And the, the real challenge with those and the real risk with those is that the actual fluid escaping through those has the velocity which is actually higher than a rifle bullet. And the injuries that come about from that are actually quite small. And as we can see on the picture on the left, the, the actual entry site may look quite innocuous. It might look quite small. So you might just have a small red mark. But the picture on the right actually shows the surgery that is required to put that right. So we need to actually open up quite a lot of the person to actually clean out all the fluids and everything else, uh, all the hydraulic fluid and stuff that's been injected into the system. So two very important topics. Um, next slide, please, Jakob. Um, part of the, or as I was talking to the working group, I thought it'd be interesting to look at the statistics over the last few years. Um, and we can actually see that there are uh, quite a number of uh, incidents still occurring with hazardous energy. So this standard will be uh, really important to, to the industry. So next slide, please, Jakob. A little bit on how we develop standards. Um, the, the risk register, uh, or the top 25 hazards in the wind industry shows that electrical energy and hazardous energy are hot topics. So that will be prior, that's been prioritized by the training committee. And the training committee actually give us then the working group of subject matter experts to go and develop this. Um, I must point out at this stage that we're actually in the scoping phase. So some of the details that I give you in the next few slides will actually potentially change. Um, what we've done so far is we've gathered the risk assessment for um, hazardous energy work and we're actually analysing that now to look at what will form learning objectives for that. We'll go through a stage gate development process and then it will um, of course be pilot tested later on next year and then rolled out and introduced to the market. Um, and then once it's been in operation for a year, it will go through a review and then it will go into the normal two yearly review cycle. So next slide, please. Sure. <clears throat> uh, you have two questions, uh, Alex, if you want to take them. Yeah. Up, you know. So one question, yeah. control of hazard standard will be a reinforcement of the hazards that are already mentioned on each GW module. Um, there is, uh, through the analysis, we've looked at BTT and there is some of the topics that are dealt with. Uh, so some of those topics will be expanded and gone into more detail, yes. And then we will probably have some additional things that we put into this, this training standard. Yes, and another question on the time duration, but I think you will get to that later on, right? Yeah, the, on the time duration, don't know yet. Okay. Um, and I, I don't even want to guess because I'm, I'm not 
uh, I really don't want the sort of training standard to be boxed in by a time frame right now. I would like to see what we need to teach and from that then make an assessment of the time. Okay. As with all of our training, then we are going to focus the uh, training in the practical area because that is what builds uh, skills and competence. The model that you see on the screen or the, the visual is adapted from work done by Edgar Dale on learning retention. And what he found was that after about two weeks, people tend to remember 10% of what they read, 20% of lectures, 30% of audio visual, and then up to 80 and 90% of actual practice and teaching others. So the training standard the, will focus in the practical areas. Uh, so that the people that, that learn those skills will actually then be able to apply them into the real world. Thank you. Next slide. Yep. The target group is people in the wind industry that will be exposed to hazardous energy. Um, that's, that's quite broad, actually. So um, that may get narrowed down slightly um, as the project <coughs> develops, but that is the aim. Um, the scope so far is to identify common risks between the GWO members and we've started on that through the risk assessment uh, in the working group. We need to identify common training between GWO members because we don't, we're not in the business of just creating training for the sake of creating training. We want it to be meaningful and we want it to be standardised. So we need to have a look at what training is already being carried out and how the new standard will actually uh, replace that potentially. We of course need to look at common areas between legislation and then create a training standard to mitigate the risks and then hopefully replace existing training. So, next slide please. Okay. The focus areas uh, from the working group. Um, positive attitude and mindset uh, is very important. If people are positive and they're bought into uh, something they will do it. So that is very important in this training, uh, as with all of the GWO training. Um, practical training to build competence, um, to make sure that they can actually look after themselves. Um, one area we will look at is roles and responsibilities. There is a lot of rules out there, in particular with electrical safety. So we need to look at the roles of the people that we're teaching. And we also need to teach them about their boundaries within that role. So what is it I can do once I'm trained under this standard? And where do I stop and where do I seek help? Or where do I need additional training? We will, of course, look at the risks from hazardous energy sources. So electricity, hydraulics, mechanical energy and other energies that may come up in the working group. We'll look into precautionary techniques. So how do you look after yourself around hazardous energy? So things like when we're operating circuit breakers, how do we position ourselves to mitigate the or to lower the risks of injury? Uh, safe and correct measurement and isolation. Another area that's really important uh, is external generators. Uh, where we're connecting external generators into turbines and when we're using them on installation sites, for example, and how we earth those, how we protect the tools that we're using and how we prevent backfeed into a turbine system. Then there are some very specific considerations for electrical shock uh, in terms of first aid. So we need to identify those and actually put those into the training. So when people have an electrical shock, the outward signs may not actually be visible, but internally they can have things wrong with their heart or they can have burns internally. So we need to look at what is the first aid considerations for that. And of course, we will look at lockout, tag out. So next slide, please, Jakob. The initial assessment, and I will just really put a uh, make it clear that this is an initial assessment uh, and this is liable to be changed. So but initially we're looking at potentially four modules. One will be hazardous energy for safe or hazardous energy safety for ordinary persons. Uh, that is people who are working on a wind farm or working in turbines 
but who do not need to apply isolations. So it could be a technician that is just tightening bolts in a tower and he needs to know about using the electrical tools and hydraulic tools, but he doesn't need to necessarily go and isolate anything. Then electrical safety for qualified persons. So that will actually be people who are doing electrical work and applying isolations. Hmm. We will do something with uh, pressurized fluids, so hydraulics. And again, for people who are working with and around those and actually applying isolations and then lock out, tag out. And that will basically be applied across the board and what the sort of requirements are in terms of locking stuff out. So next slide, please, Jacob. So I'll take a question here. So one of the questions yeah. that you had earlier was on the interplay between this and the BTT. Yeah. And that's it's too early for us to say exactly how that that will uh, those two will play together. But there is, uh, of course, there is some over overlap, and we need to figure out how those overlaps are um, avoided the most. Yes. And another question yeah. here is: Will this electrical training be offered by all companies who offer GWO trainings to, or just by a few? And I, I can take that answer: It will be by a few, uh, by those that are able. Uh, to do it and are able to show to an auditor that they can deliver the training uh, according to the learning objectives. Uh, so you will have to have certain equipment, of course, and certain uh, instructors with certain skills, and your physical um, environment needs to be uh, checked, and you have you know, the ordinary uh, drill for this. It's likely that we'll see that the training providers already conducting BTT quite often we'll have both equipment and instructor capability to take this step. So exactly. Yes. That's a good base. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, just a few practicalities. The standard is due to be launched October 1st next year. Um, as I say, we're in the scoping phase at the moment. Um, so the project will run on through next year and then we'll do pilot training later on next year. Um, you can see we have a, a mixed group in, in the actual working group. And then as we go on, later on, when we start looking at pilot training, then we're going to actually bring training providers on board to actually carry out that pilot training. So, and that is all on control of hazardous energy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, before I go to the Q3 report, there is a more general question here on whether we are developing GWO training standards and certification scheme like those of OPITO uh, that some of us know from oil and gas. And uh, for that question, yes, uh, in a sense, uh, GWO is the OPITO of wind energy. Um, and we do develop um, training standards and certification scheme. And, and that is our that is our realm. Uh, the big difference between GWO and OPITO, uh, apart from the fact that they work in oil and gas and we work in wind and we address uh, very different risks um, and very different work fun functions and, and, and roles, is that we are owned by industry and not, not for profit, whereas OPITO and the Advantage system has uh, some private ownership. And um, so we are in the not for, pro not for profit and working for industry and controlled by industry itself. Um, uh, there's another question and the same from the same person is whether we will accept dual certificates or mutual uh, mutual recognition of training um, <clears throat> and um, uh, in so far as if there is other training that covers the same risks uh, for the same type of personnel it will be up to the duty holder to uh, to accept whether or not they will uh, they will accept that other training. So this is not uh, within our scope uh, to judge whether one or not one or another training is is good or bad uh, for purpose or fit for purpose. And we will develop some training standard that our members see as fit for purpose. Uh, but if there are other other trainings out there that are equally fit for purpose, it's up to those uh, employers and and legal duty holders to uh, to accept that. Um, uh, we do have a system for uh, recognizing training that is similar, uh, where we can assess 
uh, and give merit uh, to uh, to previously uh, uh, acquired training from different systems or from uh, related uh, uh, industries. It is a, a process that uh, must be carried out by by an employer uh, who has a management system to support the documentation and the keeping of that documentation of previous training. Um, so if you are an employer that has a lot of uh, uh, technicians working in wind with other training that is similar and you wish to uh, to merit it against each of you, let's uh, you know, get in touch with us and we can help you. Um, question on Slinger Signaler or Rigger Signal Person or Slinger Banksman. It's one of those where um, it has several names depending on where you are. Do you know how the oil and gas will approve the GWO Slinger Signaler? Uh, frankly, no, we don't know. Uh, maybe you can answer this, Jakob. No, I, I mean, it, as always, it's one of the areas where we look at uh, mutual recognition. And it's not an area where we could say it has been, we have excelled so far in, in the sense that uh, it's always up to our members and our duty holders if they have an interest in doing that. So I think we'll see a mutual recognition of not only the Slinger Signaler, but also all the other GWO training standards at the point where, our, where we have enough members who are actively both in oil and gas and in wind, thereby creating the incentive to have a mobile workforce. Uh, until that happens, uh, it, we're open for it. I'm sure, we have, uh, we, we are willing to go into dialogue, but it's not an area where we're kind of aggressively follow on, following up on that. We have some circumstances where in the in Germany we have our first aid. There's a mutual uh, kind of setup. Some of our training providers they are both DGUV certified and GWO first aid, so you can go in do one training and walk out with two certificates. Yeah. Um, I guess that's potentially, that can potentially happen with the uh, Slinger Signal as well, but it hasn't been requested yet. So as I think some of us mentioned before, the Slinger Signaler, uh, when, when the working group created this and scouted the market, there were more than 400 different kinds of uh, training courses on offering out there from various uh, sources. Um, so who, who knows what's what was in all of those? So probably most of them very good. Uh, we just don't know what the, what the regiment uh, is for for making sure that the training is good. And so I think that's something which we're, we're changing, uh, and potentially that could interest the oil and gas industry uh, to use a, a, a training course that is. Um, recognized and audited by a third party. But then let's see, that's interesting. Uh, so Alex, a question uh, to you uh, on the electric trainings. <clears throat> As, yeah. Will the training be equal to the German electric trainings like qualified electricians according to VDE 1010 and VDE 0105-100 and DGUV3? Quite a uh, no. question. Pro probably not as a qualified electrician under those standards. No. No. So the the intention is to create an in a, a hazardous energy safety training that will be on top of uh, what kind of normal, uh, what kind of a qualification you come with, a general qualification you come with as an electrician, right? Exactly. Yes. It will yeah. be a a sort of wind specific. Um, training in hazardous energy and and then using meters and stuff to prove dead and stuff. Yes. yes. So in addition, especially for wind turbines, exactly. Um, yeah. And the question on, up, thanks for updating the window fee, but how often can we expect the changes in the window fee? Uh, so that's a question for me. Um, not very often is the, is the answer. It's not something we do a, a every month or every week. Uh, this is something that will happen. If it happens again, it will be every year and we will make sure that we um, communicate well in advance uh, that we update um, the winter fee, which is what we did for, for this, uh, this update. I think we communicated this first time about four months ago when we first learned about it. So now we're delivering on, on that uh, promise. 
So we don't want anyone to, <clears throat> um, yeah, to lose out on um, on uh, on anything if they have uh, purchased credit at a higher price. Uh, that's uh, and then they we get to give them a, a lower price. That could be a problem, right? Um, so we don't want that situation to happen too often. So we try to communicate as as fine an answer as possible. But the, the, the short question is, you cannot expect this to happen very often, and I don't think it will happen uh, uh, before at the earliest January 2021, if at all. Okay, let's get to the uh, Q3 report. <clears throat> Here is um, uh, the global map of training centers. All of the green uh, countries are new countries on our list. All of the green uh, markers are newly certified uh, in 2019. And the latest count, and this is the count from uh, Q3, but latest count that I got just got uh, a few minutes ago is that we have just passed the 350 uh, training sensors mark. Uh, so that's great news. And there's a lot of growth, <clears throat> especially uh, we see the growth coming, uh, not just in Europe, but the interest is uh, certainly growing in, uh, in North and Central America, South America, uh, China, Asia, uh, South Africa. It's uh, everywhere really and that's uh, uh, good news of course um, <clears throat> something that um, that we're mindful of is that the markets the new markets and emerging markets for for wind are uh, also in countries that does not yet have a lot of uh, GWO training centers um, such as in, uh, Egypt Morocco um, Taiwan there's one um, North Australia, well, there's nothing. There was someone in Australia, but Australia is a very big country, so traveling across Australia is like traveling across uh, uh, the US almost. So there is still uh, some work to do, and we are, of course, trying to support this with, with auditor training uh, wherever we can. A short update on GWO and GWEC. We GWEC, for those of you who don't know it, is the Global Wind Energy Council. Uh, the Global Wind Energy Council is the, the policy lobby organization of the wind industry. Uh, so in GWO, we do not do uh, lobby uh, work. We stick to uh, the governance scheme of, of safety training. Uh, but GWEC is the policy uh, and lobby arm, and mostly in global uh, policy, that means climate change. And as, as another key function, they help uh, new markets establish themselves uh, with uh, with wind organizations and, and uh, with conferences and fairs. And the uh, the agreement that and, and GWEC also supports the market with um, intelligence on uh, market forecasts. So what we have done is joining forces, looking into how can we uh, together provide. Uh, a better better forecast uh, to the market and to our training centers on uh, the need for for training i what is the what can we expect in job creation in new and emerging markets and uh, we can use our insight into um, uh, the framework for for training uh, a new personnel and 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 establishing um, new organizations to support installation of new megawatts and they can use their uh, forecasting skills in in the forecasting megawatts installed and marrying those two will give us uh, potential to create some reports and that's what we are aiming to do in the next three years <clears throat> um, some numbers for you IRENA the International Renewable Energy Asians Agency uh, it says 1.2 million jobs globally are created by the wind industry. It's a very rough figure. Um, but we know that 92,000 of those, 85,000 it says here, but 92,000 latest count have a valid training in winter, meaning we are covering as a, as a community about 
one tenth or less uh, than the, uh, the, the the scope. So there's a lot of growth that we need to do. Um, and the potential for job creation and economic growth is high. And new and new markets onshore and offshore. Um, <clears throat> and in all markets, there is a, a safety is without borders, right? So we have a, um, we have a, an obligation we feel to help make sure that there is safety training available in all of those new markets. And that's uh, that's what we're trying to do, uh, uh, joint partnership, GWIC and, and GWA. All right, let's move on. Oh, yeah. You can tell that I'm new to the technology almost. Oh, it's been a long time since I used this. So coming up in 2020, dates for your diary. December is now quarterly webinar episode three, effective December to a window alignment, uh, window fee alignment to uh, the Human Development Index, 1st of January. Oh, uh, sorry, Vijay. Uh, of course, we're updating the window fee to the UN Human Development Index every year, whenever there is a UN new UN report out. But that does not happen more than every year, and, and it hasn't changed. Uh, um, it's two years ago they issued the last one, so it should be maybe next year there will be one new one. And we have executive expo meetings uh, in January. We will be at the AWEA conference, Operation Maintenance and Safety, on uh, end of February in San Diego, uh, hopefully with a presentation by Brian Walenchik, our uh, chair for North American Committee. Brian is also the uh, a GE health and safety uh, head in in um, in North America. On in March we have our general assembly of the membership, and that will be not on 9th March but 11th of March. And on that date is when we confirm our work plan for next year. <clears throat> when we also elect our new uh, uh, executive committee. Um, and the chairs of the, the various committees. We have a number of publications due in April, uh, version two of the Advanced Rescue and Enhanced First Aid, a new criteria for training providers and certification bodies, as we talked about early on. And then later on in April, the Wind Workforce uh, Forecast Report. And we aim to see if we can publish this uh, at the same time in Taiwan doing the Taiwan wind power and in uh, the US doing the IPF uh, 2020 in uh, Rhode Island, Providence to Rhode Island. And both in both places we will uh, uh, have a short, uh, have, a, have a small social event uh, related to this. So if you are in the, in the vicinity, uh, look us up. Any questions? Any more questions, that is? Will there be a list on the GW homepage which companies will offer the electrical training? Yes, Michael, there will be a list as soon as they are, um, as soon as they are certified they will be on the list and maybe I can just jump from the presentation and into, let's see if I can do this. I'll show you on the website. We will go on the website. Uh, I don't need Google Maps for that, but globalwindsafety.org. And you can find training providers here. Boom. Find a training provider. And there should be a search function somewhere here so that you can search it. Uh, where is that search function? Well, at least you can see on the list here who's delivering what kind of training. Let's go to Africa, LT Tech South Africa, do blade repair. 
um, Asia Elimac group in Shanghai, first aid, manual handling, and so forth. So you can you will be able to find this on the on the website who is doing uh, that. Will BTC be a pre requirement for the electrical course or vice versa? Alex, that's for you. We don't know. Um, at this at this stage, we don't know. Uh, we're still we're still analysing BTT to see where the overlaps are and how that will relate to the new standards. So, yeah, sorry to be so vague on that, but we we need to go through the process of analysing it first. Yeah. All right. Um, any more questions? Nope. I don't see any more. Let me just check that I have found uh, answered everything. Yeah, I think we have gone through all of the questions. So, as always, um, thank you for for joining us um, for this uh, this quarterly webinar, and thank you for all of the questions. If you have any uh, questions that come up, uh, like three minutes from now, from now or three weeks from now. You can always uh, uh, throw that question at us, uh, right to uh, info at globalwindsafety.org. We have um, people standing by to answer all of those questions. And if it's a very, very difficult question, it may take some time, but usually we are quite fast in answering less than 24 hours uh, when, if you use the info at Global Wind Safety for all sorts of inquiries. Um, so please use that. and. Uh, Looking forward to uh, to see you next time somewhere in the world, uh, Taiwan, San Diego, Providence, where it may be, or you are welcome to visit us here at the office in Copenhagen, and we always have coffee uh, ready uh, for visitors. And yeah, maybe from uh, those of us who are in in the Western Hemisphere, at least it's almost Christmas. So for you, I will. Uh, I will um, wish you a happy uh, happy holidays, and uh, we will be uh, closing down the office between the 23rd and second uh, of 23rd of uh, December and second of uh, January. Um, so bear with us. Uh, answer times will be a little bit uh, longer in that period. Thank you very much, and have a great day.